All right, so this is Lincoln's. Now, how does Lincoln then emerge as, the, as a major figure in 1850s politics? Well, the first thing is, just as you might say ideologically, Lincoln is located in a very strategic position. He positions himself right in the middle of anti-slavery politics. So too, geographically, Lincoln is very strategically located. He's in Illinois. Remember, Illinois is a key, doubtful state. Remember the election of 1856. Republicans lost Illinois. They cannot win in 1860 without Illinois. If Lincoln is in Maine, no one wants to hear from him because they're going to carry Maine no matter who uh, is running. Um, number two, it's the state of Stephen A. Douglas. Lincoln is there. If Lincoln is in Michigan, Lincoln becomes a famous person by debating with Douglas. He shines, you might say, in the reflected, like the moon, he shines in the reflected light of Douglas. Douglas is the great figure of the 1850s, not Lincoln. Lincoln's stature rises by debating with Douglas. The presence of Douglas is great good luck for Lincoln. Thirdly, he's from central Illinois. Illinois is like a little microcosm of the irrepressible conflict. Northern Illinois is increasingly anti-slavery as more and more migrants from the East move in. Um, the Republicans are strong in Northern Illinois. Southern Illinois, pro-Southern, not so pro-slavery, deeply racist, strong kinship connections with the South. They're voting Democratic. And then there's this central belt, just like Pennsylvania, Illinois, Maryland, it's the center, the border. Central Illinois, that's where Lincoln is. So even within Illinois, he occupies the right place to, for political leadership. And he's also, as I say, centrally located between radical Republicans and conservative Republicans. He's acceptable to both of them. So Lincoln is a very, in a very strategic location. So as I say, Lincoln comes back into politics in 1854 in response to the Kansas Nebraska Act. Um, and uh, he actually tries to get elected to the Senate. Remember, back then, the legislature, the, the members of the legislature elect the senators. It's not popular vote. And when the Democrat, there's like, as, it, as everywhere else, the election of 1854 in Illinois destroys the Democratic Party's majority, but no one knows what the new majority is. There are no nothings anti-slavery Democrats, anti-slavery Whigs. They've got a majority in the legislature if they can all get together. Lincoln emerges as the candidate of the anti-slavery Whigs for the Senate. And in early 1855, he comes very close to being elected to the Senate, but he cannot get a majority of the legislature. He comes three or four or five votes short. Why? Because anti-slavery Democrats, those who are breaking with Douglas, do not want to go with a Whig. They insist, all right, if you guys are really anti-slavery, we have a man, Lyman Trumbull, very distinguished jurist, lawyer. He's breaking. He, he doesn't want anything to do with Douglas. He's breaking with the Democratic Party over this Kansas, Nebraska. Let's put him into the Senate. He starts out with five or six votes, but eventually, Lincoln, the Democrats keep gaining, and, and, and when Lincoln sees he can't win and a Democrat might be elected, he tells all his Whig supporters, throw your support to Trumbull. And Trumbull is elected. Not Lincoln, but Trumbull. This little episode has two important results. One, it underlines, if ever it needed it, that this new kind of political coalition has to kind of coalesce, that if they're going to operate on the basis of previous party alignments, they're not going to get anywhere. And secondly, it, Lincoln's self-sacrifice makes him the presumptive candidate of the Republicans four years hence, 1858, when Stephen A. Douglas's term will run out. So Lincoln starts campaigning for the Senate, suppose, pretty much, uh, after um, this loss in 1855. And he travels around Illinois. He campaigns in 1856 for John C. Fremont, the Republican presidential candidate. He goes around answering Douglas. Douglas goes around giving speeches, defending himself. Lincoln follow, it becomes humiliating. Douglas comes to town, gives a big speech. And then that evening, uh, Lincoln says, well, uh, come and hear me, and I'll tell you 
I'll give you an anti-Douglas speech. Finally, people say, look, Lincoln, you, gotta, you can't just follow around Douglas. It makes you look ridiculous. So, um, but nonetheless, he grows by association with Douglas. Then comes along 1858, when Lincoln is now going to run for the Senate against Douglas. But, well, wait a minute, this is a new Douglas. This is the Douglas who has opposed the Buchanan administration on the Lecompton bill, right? He's now an anti-Southern Democrat. He's, the, the Buchanan administration is trying to destroy him. He stood up to the South on Kansas. A lot of Eastern Republicans, like Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, say to Illinois Dem Republicans, don't run anyone against him. Let's get Douglas back into the Senate. In fact, we'll get him into the Republican Party. We need him. What a great leader. And he's broken with his party. So let's not annoy him, so to speak. Let's, let, let's support, in effect, Douglas. Well, Lincoln is opposed to that, and most Illinois Republicans are opposed to it. And this is why, in June 1858, the Republican State Convention actually formally nominates Lincoln for the Senate. This had not been done before. Normally, they, you know, there were people who knew who were candidates, but it wasn't until the legislature met that declared candidates would come forward. Now, six months before the legislature is going to meet, the Republican Party says Lincoln is our candidate for the Senate in order to forestall these Easterners trying to help out Douglas. And that is why Lincoln gives this great House Divided speech. At that, at that convention, the Republican State Convention, Lincoln gives the key address, and of course, he begins as follows. We are now far into the fifth year, that is since 1854, since a policy was initiated with the avowed object of putting an end to slavery agitation. That's Douglas's plan. Under the operation of that policy, the agitation has not only not ceased, but has continually augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. Remember that sentence. A crisis reached and passed. Two sessions from now. That's what happens in the secession crisis and how it shapes Lincoln's response. A house divided against itself cannot stand. That's out of the Bible, of course. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become one, all one thing or all the other. Ah, here he is. There's Douglas, the little giant. This is the guy that Lincoln will be debating, a very formidable, tough-looking fellow. What is the purpose of the House Divided speech? It must become all one thing or all the other. There is no middle ground. L Douglas is trying to occupy the middle ground. This is an... This is the first blow of, it's not a philosophical speech, it's the first blow of the Senate campaign to try to undermine Douglas's position of popular sovereignty, which is, claims to be the middle ground, but there cannot be a middle ground. The House divided cannot survive. It's got to be one thing or the other. Either you go for Lincoln or you go for the Southerners. There's no other alternative. That's the message here. 